Welcome to Scrolling to Death. Today, I'm super grateful to be joined by Congresswoman Kat Kamek of Florida. Thank you for being here, Representative Kamek. Hey, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Of course. So uh, listeners here are concerned. They're worried about social media and what it's doing to our children, to their mental health, to their privacy. And I know that you are deep in the trenches on these issues. So first, are parents right to be concerned? Do you believe that social media use is a risk to our children? You know, I think not only parents have a right to be concerned, but everyone should be concerned about the amount of information that is being collected, harvested, and shared about every aspect of your life on social media. And in particular, when it comes to kids, you Mm -hmm. have a very vulnerable and impressionable population. And so, yeah, there's absolutely a cause for concern. You can look at any of the recent studies articles, reports, documentaries that have come out. You Mm -hmm. see some of the founders of social media as we know it today who are saying, I won't let my kids on social media because they know on the back end how these algorithms are designed and how they use that data. Mm -hmm. And so um, whether it is these really, really dangerous challenges that these kids can sometimes take part in Mm -hmm. that um, have ended in tragedy, Mm -hmm. or uh, you see people exploiting children on social media. It is something that parents absolutely need to be concerned about. And Mm -hmm. as I said, everyone should be concerned about the amount of information about themselves and their families that is out there online as a result of social media. Right. So some recent things that have really shocked me, I recently interviewed Joanne Bogard, whose son died from the choking challenge. There's so many parents, I need to make sure I get them right. Um, And then Meg Stumer, whose daughter was in a deadly accident uh, from the speed challenge. So I know a lot of constituents will share their stories with you. What is one of the most shocking things you've learned about recently? Something that parents should just be aware of? Unfortunately, it's hard to be shocked anymore um, with some of the things that, you know, we've, we've heard from parents um, the thing that never, ever seems to to go away are, of course, the stories that parents bring to you, mm-hmm. and in particular, the stories where um, they've lost their children. Um, yeah. Snapchat, it's, it's always seemingly Snapchat when we're talking about kids mm-hmm. getting a hold of drugs, right? Mm-hmm. Snapchat has kind of become, if you want... If you want the drugs or drug dealers want access to kids in a new market, they use that platform predominantly. Um, When it comes to exploitation and sex and violence, TikTok is uh, really kind of a leader in that space. One of the things that has always shocked me is how you have kids who are model students, never had a problem, never in trouble with the law, um, got on Snapchat and within a matter of weeks had passed away because yeah. they, through the technology on the app, through geofencing and, and geolocation, they were able to be targeted and thought that they were taking an you know Adderall or they were taking a Xanax mm-hmm. or a Percocet mm-hmm. and it ended up being fentanyl and they died. And I hear those stories over and over and over and over again, and it is shocking. But the thing that is that stays with me the most is that the parents themselves, they they're shell shocked and they yeah. they they just still feel like it's almost a surreal experience of my child was never, uh, you know, a, a, a troublemaker. My child was never into this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I, how did, could this happen? Mm-hmm. And it just it happens so fast that I think people are struggling to keep up with it. And so, you know, I hear, I hear about a lot when it comes to Snapchat with the drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've had constituents of mine who they have had children that have passed um, that again, never had done anything or they thought they were taking something else and it turned out to be, you know, deadly. Um, The exploitation factor on so many of the other sites with whether it's Instagram, Meta, Mm -hmm. um, TikTok, especially people who reach out as, uh, you know, they identify some of these young, particularly women um, on social media, and they basically treat them as prey Mm -hmm. and it becomes a game. And I have a young nephew and niece and I have begged them, please do not get on social media. Um, And what content they get is for my nephew, incredibly mm-hmm. violent, and right. for my niece, incredibly explicit and sexual. Right. These are young, young kids. And it is shocking to me how 
in a in a time where we know how dangerous this is it is still allowed to continue despite all of the attention that it's getting it's still going on today it's still the number one communication platform for teenagers i mean especially snapchat where you're right kids are dying from these fake pills that are made with fentanyl, they're being told that it's an an oxy or a, um, a Percocet, and it's there's no active ingredient in it. It's all fentanyl, and a lot of these kids think they're just experimenting, like you know we used to do or our parents used to do back in the day when it just wasn't so deadly and scary. And um, so parents like me or we are faced with this impossible choice. We either withhold social media access and ostracize our kids from all their friends, or we give them social media and in doing so, like end their childhood. They're inundated with violence and sexuality and drugs and addiction. And there's not really a right choice. Um, so we're, we need help. And what is being done on a legislative level to help parents through this and to force these platforms to be safer for our kids? Yeah. You know, I think the the biggest thing that we need to do is one have an awareness of mm -hmm. all the things that are out there and i know there's a lot of really great nonprofits and and organizations that do work to try to help parents navigate yeah. this time uh yeah. that we're living in I, I you know my husband and i as we talk about having a family mm -hmm. i tell him i am absolutely terrified of mm -hmm how kids today have to grow up where they just, they're not allowed to be kids anymore because mm -hmm. they're exposed immediately mm -hmm. to such adult content and, and very mature content. And yep. your brain isn't wired to, to, to navigate that mm -hmm. um, at such an early age. So I think one, educating parents on really what's out there because social media is always constantly evolving, new trends, new, new platforms. The algorithms are constantly being updated. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that it's it's a new challenge for parents to have yeah. to navigate. Yeah. Um, on top of that, I think that there's a role in education for teaching online safety for kids and really yeah. understanding, giving giving kids the tools for, hey, this is this is what's appropriate, this is what isn't. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's important. But yeah. on a legislative side, we want to empower parents, right? Because I think when you have the heavy hand of government that comes in and says, this is what you're going to do and this is how you're going to do it, that can't end anywhere good. Mm -hmm. uh, because in government, we see where you give an inch and then they take a mile. Mm -hmm. I want government to help facilitate parents being in the driver's seat when it comes to what their kids are exposed to. Okay. And I think that by and large, protecting children's data and their privacy mm -hmm. is paramount. That's where I see the role of the federal government coming in because we now know going through the 21st century that mm -hmm. data is the new currency. That is how all these massive AI models operate. That's the backbone of these, these models. Yep. And so if we don't basically turn the tap off when it mm -hmm. comes to this very young, impressionable um, group of people it, you know, at 13, some, some is young, you know, some younger than that. Mm -hmm. They're collecting this data on these kids starting at the earliest years and tracking them throughout the, their lifeline. That's a gold mine. So yeah. you see where companies and organizations want access to that. This is where us as the federal government need to step in and say, no, you don't own that data. You mm -hmm. don't get the right to that data. Only a parent can make the decision for their child what they are willing to share. So okay. that is a huge, huge challenge because you have so many competing forces trying to navigate this. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a lot of special interests in this space. Um, I, I can't even turn on the television without seeing a stupid TikTok commercial and, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to pull my hair out. Yeah. Um, it is, it is really, really scary, but I think this is where we really need parents to work hand in glove with legislators because we have to make sure that parents are in the in the room for the conversation in crafting this mm -hmm. uh, because again you have too many special interests at work here that want to make special exceptions and carve outs and at the end of the day if you are not in charge of your data your privacy mm -hmm. um then you're really not in charge of anything and so i think that's really really the the bedrock of where we need to go Okay. Are there current bills that you feel would be um, helpful in this space that we can communicate to our representatives? Is it COSA? Is it APRA? Is it sunsetting Section 230? 
what are you feeling right now? So I don't think there's any particular silver bullet, right? Um, okay. yeah. HOSA and COPPA, right? Are the, yeah. Those are the two big children's safety pieces of legislation. Um, one that is in, you know, some pretty serious need for updating to meet the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're well on our way. Okay. I, I think with APRA, right, the, the, the new major national data privacy standard, yeah. that is long overdue in terms of we have long needed a national standard. Because any company, and I don't care if it is your your local, you know, soap maker, which actually mm -hmm. in my district, I have a soap maker, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, whether it's, you know, just like someone who's doing something on the side to any business, any mom mm -hmm. and pop operation, you're yeah. doing interstate business, right? Everybody has an online presence in some form, but you're mm -hmm. not, especially in a small business setup going to be able to comply with 50 individual state yes, laws right. regarding privacy and data and how you manage that. So that's mm -hmm. where that federal standard is needed. And that's where the constitutional nexus of interstate commerce comes in. Mm -hmm. On that front, we see a lot in the way of with this, this data privacy standard, where, where are the limits, right? And mm -hmm. for me, I might be extreme in that I think you as an individual should be compensated for your data right. if it's being sold. We've seen companies get insanely wealthy mm -hmm. off of the harvesting and collection and subsequent sale of your personal data yep. and has gone, I mean, how many breaches has have there been from companies with very sensitive data where then all of a sudden you see Oh, sorry. Here's a, you know, one year subscription to LifeLock, but right. lock, you know, that's laughable. If yeah. people, if people want to really be serious about maintaining control of their data, mm -hmm. I think you should be compensated for it. There should be some vehicle. Um, so those are some of the ideas that we're kicking around. You mentioned section 230. I don't think that um, section 230 is the end all be all okay. in particular, because um, what you see then on the flip side of that is extreme censorship. Mm, Everyone okay. has long said that, oh, well, if we get rid of Section 230, they won't be able to censor people anymore. Actually, that's, I believe, inaccurate. I think at that point, the extremes on both sides right. then will be like, nope, that's too much of a liability. So yeah. more people lose their voice. Makes sense. We have to find a way to really update the new public square, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what social media has become in so many ways. The new public square where discussions and ideas and people exercise and express their, their First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. But along with that comes a responsibility, right? Because you, you, you can't vandalize, you know, if you're mm -hmm. out there assembling, you, you can peacefully assemble. You can't you know, go out and vandalize and create chaos. Yeah. There, that same maxim should be true online, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a really, really important discussion that we as legislators, but more importantly, with parents, with constituents, with mm -hmm. um, people who are concerned about this issue, um, need to be talking about. And unfortunately, we live in an era, I call it angertainment, mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm where it's more about chasing the headlines of the day than having the really serious, important conversations. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I know there won't be, I don't think, a perfect bill because there's a lot that goes into yeah. it. And But I also know that big tech is lobbying against and fighting against all of these bills when it comes to just keeping our kids safe online. Um, is it realistic for us parents to expect something to go through? I know you can't, you know, like a crystal ball, but how much pressure are you guys getting from the big tech lobbyists and big tech teams? You know, I, I will say the, um, the biggest big tech army that I have ever seen was TikTok. Um, you know, huh. they, they mm -hmm. broke records with how many lobbyists they employed and, you know, deployed to Capitol Hill, um, spending millions and millions. I'm, like, I'm serious. They broke records. Mm -hmm. And um, even the CEO came to my office and tried to sway me. Um, wow. But I, I think that's the thing that is maybe misunderstood about how Washington works. You know, the most powerful voices are those of the people, particularly the people that elect us to do the job. Yeah. And so if I have a parent who comes up from Gainesville, Florida, or Ocala, Florida, or Lake City, I'm going to take that meeting over the TikTok CEO meeting every day of the week. Mm -hmm. Because that person, it has a very, very pure purpose for being here, right? Mm -hmm. 
the lobbyists that come and advocate on behalf of their company, whether it's Meta or Snapchat or um, TikTok, Mm -hmm. they all have an angle and their angle is to maintain as much access unfettered to people's data as humanly possible because it is such big business. It is massive. We're talking billions of dollars Mm -hmm. um, that is at stake for these companies. And in the case of TikTok, it's far more nefarious than just, you know, trying to turn it into a cash cow. Mm -hmm. It's also a geopolitical tool, you know, for the CCP. And so I I would say there can be a lot of pressure, but when you know what your values and your principles are, and you mm-hmm. know who you really work for, mm-hmm. the, the people who are knocking on your door doesn't really bother you that much. Because at the end of the day, these companies don't vote for me. My parents back home vote for me. And I want to do everything yeah. I possibly can to protect them and their families. Okay. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Let's touch on TikTok before we close out. Uh, okay. So listeners are very familiar with the new legislation requiring uh, ByteDance to sell TikTok to an American company, or we will, we will remove it from our app stores. Uh, yeah. Why briefly do you feel that this legislation was necessary? You know, I, I think you've seen multiple administrations try to address TikTok. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, the language in this particular bill that was passed through the House and the Senate and signed by uh, President Biden, mm-hmm. that was really the culmination of bipartisan work identifying a true legitimate threat. Now people say, oh, it's not a threat. It's not a threat. It's a, you know, um, a first amendment issue. This is not a first amendment issue. Quite frankly, no one is concerned about your dancing videos or, you know, makeup tutorials or whatever. Mm -hmm. No one cares. What people aren't talking about is how the TikTok algorithm is wildly, vastly different Mm -hmm. than say the algorithms employed on Snapchat or Meta. Mm -hmm. TikTok utilizes what's called a behavioral algorithm, which is designed to show you more and more violent or shocking content to keep your eyeballs on the screen. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're doing that is because TikTok is a form of spyware. It's malware effectively. Same as Timu, which is also a Chinese Communist Party owned app. Oh, um, they are literally tracking your keystrokes, your geolocation. Um, they are going through financial data. They're looking at your passwords, who you're talking to. And the reason why they're doing that is because they're harvesting data for geopolitical purposes. We have seen where they have used this information mm-hmm. to influence elections in other countries at the request of the Chinese Communist Party. Wow. And when people say, oh, it's not a Chinese com- uh, company, it's owned by you know investors or whatever. Yes, they do have some American investors, but what is important to remember is that they have given a golden share to the CCP, which is required by Chinese law. A golden share requires by law that at any given moment, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, can say, we want data on this person and this person, and we want everything you've got on them, or we want you to push out a message. And we saw that in action when we brought this bill to be marked up in the Energy and Commerce Committee. Mm -hmm. They actually geofenced all of the TikTok users in my district and said, put a a landing page on the app and said, call Representative Kat Kamak and tell her you don't want TikTok shut down. Mm -hmm. And I had my my phone lines flooded. And of course, there was a ton of young kids. I mean, kids in school crying. (laughs) You could hear them in class. They were literally crying. Oh, my God. The thing that was most terrifying was not just the grip that they had on these kids, but the fact that they were demanding an action of these people before you could use the app. Wow. And so people were calling saying, oh, I don't want you to take out TikTok. And the thing I'll remind people is this wasn't just about TikTok. This was about companies that meet a very specific requirement Mm -hmm. that are controlled by the CCP. Yeah. And I had a grown man call and say, I don't want you to take action against TikTok. And then he called back about two minutes later and says, I want to pull back my opinion. And we said, why? And he said, because now I'm seeing that in order to use this, in order to get access to my account, I have to do something for them. And he said, is this what it's going to be? And how do they know where I am if they are not accessing my information? Mm -hmm. Like you (laughs) see it in action. I'm like, this is what we've been trying to tell everyone. This is why it's so crazy, you know? And so- Imagine that, that type of power. Yeah. 
a, this very addictive algorithm that is designed to keep you on the screen, right? Mm -hmm. And influence behavior. And then there is a massive geopolitical issue that comes up. Let's say China invades Taiwan mm -hmm. and the U.S. is looking to do something like sell arms or send humanitarian aid to yeah. Taiwan, whatever. Right. I'm giving a hypothetical. Yeah. In that situation, do you think that mainland China is not going to utilize 170 million foot soldiers in the United mm -hmm. States to influence policy making decisions at yeah. the highest levels of government? Right, right. That's yeah. a very, very powerful tool. And that's why we're concerned. It's not just the TikTok challenges. It's not, it's not just that. It's the fact that they're turning our children into mm -hmm. foot soldiers for the Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. It is it, terrifying. Thank you for explaining that so clearly, because I think it is much more than all the parents I've talked to whose children have been served suicide content and died. I mean, you know, that is very oh. important that we are paying yes. attention to that, but also this bigger picture is very important. And you said something like, um, we should be compensated for our data instead of giving it to them for free just to use their platform. And it reminds me of, uh, are you familiar with billionaire Frank McCourt and his people's bid for TikTok? No. Uh -uh. Okay. So he was a former owner of the Dodgers, he real estate guy. He's a billion, American billionaire. He's putting together a people's bid for TikTok. I think you would really like his book, Our Biggest Fight. I feel like a lot of the things you said were exactly things that oh, were in his book okay, about our data, about all about owning our own data, right? And so last week I was able to meet with Frank and a number of parents who've lost children to social media harms. We discussed um, transforming TikTok into a space that prioritizes safety, gives us back control over our data and our dignity. So I wonder if you believe we can get TikTok specifically to a point where its functionality can benefit American children, or do you feel like it's just a lost cause? No, I think we can because you see children are exceptionally impressionable. We've seen this through the study of, of their brains throughout the years, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and they are a reflection of the information that they are shown. We see where in one side you show kids a bunch of astronaut and science and math videos. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, they all want to be astronauts, right? Mm -hmm. right? And you show a bunch of just garbage, right? Explicit videos. And the number one thing that people want to, these kids want to be is a social media influencer. Right. right. It's absolutely a platform that could be used for good. Mm -hmm. But as the CCP has said explicitly, they will never relinquish control of it. Mm -hmm. And it, and that's very telling in my opinion, that when you have the CCP saying very publicly that they will never allow for TikTok to be sold, that tells you that it's it's more than the money for them. Yeah. And, and, and it could be an exceptionally profitable deal for people who, have invested in TikTok and want to want to cash out, but mm -hmm. the CCP won't allow it. I do think in the future, and, and I'd love to. I, I now need to read that book. Yeah, you know, I think that it could be used for good. Yeah, but right now, the way that the algorithm and the source code, by the way, which is again all on mainland China servers, mm -hmm. that is all designed in order to keep people on the screen, eyes on the screen, and it, it's just. It's unfortunate that we don't see more examples of where it can be used for good rather than, mm -hmm. I don't want to say evil because it's not all evil, but there's a lot of evil out there. Yeah. There's just so much profit. And how do you be competitive if it's not addictive in this yeah. space as we're in now? So, so anything else parents can do or parents should know regarding keeping our kids safe online, any of this legislation, anything yeah. else you want to share? The thing that I would really encourage parents to do, and, and this would, I think, I think is the most important takeaway from our time here today yeah. is that people do not understand the power of their voice. It is astonishing how much can be done by a single individual. And, and Nikki, I think you're a testament to that of what you have built and what you have done and trying to educate and helping educate and advance policy it is staggering the impact that one person can have. And to be truly effective, you don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to have access. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is start somewhere, pick a starting point, go from there. And I tell people all the time, get to know your member of Congress. If, if there's one thing you can do, you can reach out to your member of Congress. They work for you, right. build a relationship with them, get their cell phone number, be eyes and ears on the ground for them. Cause they're in, in, 40,000 different things, be eyes and ears for them. 
that becomes a trusted position where then you can help influence and help make sense of so much of the thing, the, the legislation that's coming at you. Um, those relationships should not be just with your membership, your member of Congress, but your state senator, your state representative, your county commissioner, your city commissioner, your superintendent, your school board members. Mm -hmm. I think parents today have such an opportunity to really reassert the role of parents in our communities, in our society. And it's, it really just starts with a single step of building that relationship with your elected officials. And if you have a crappy elected official, then by God, run for office. Right. That would be my message is <laughs> there is always an action item and there's right. something that you can do. And it literally only takes five minutes. And I right. promise it's so worth it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But the biggest lesson I've learned through this is that we have a voice. I'm just a mom. I didn't think I could make any difference. I didn't think that I could, co me contacting my representative would do anything at all. But oh. now I get to talk to hundreds of parents who are like, like, isn't that sad that that's where we're, what we think? I I hate that, I, I, I'm that's sorry. Like, oh. <laughs> we're just so like head down in our parenting, in our lives and our kids that I think we don't think we can make a change and influence anything. So I, but now I know, and now I, luckily I have the, uh, an audience of thousands or sometimes some months, millions of people who, if we all just step, step up and use our voices, and it literally does take four to five minutes to go on yes. senate.gov and uh, house.gov and contact your representatives, yes. just sit, asking them to, to support on, kids' online safety. Or you don't even have to know the names of bills, right? You can just ask them, mm -hmm. tell them your specific experience about something related to this, right? Oh, yeah. And I mean, I'm so glad that you gave those two websites, senate.gov, house.gov. Yeah. Super easy. You put in your zip code, find mm -hmm. your representative. Pro tip, go meet with their district office. Okay. Because everyone thinks they've got to make this, you know, journey to Washington, D.C. And believe me, we love seeing you in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. We do. But if you have a job and a family and a, and a whole thing going on, it can be very difficult. Right. And I'll tell you right now, the district team, they are always hungry to see people in their office. Mm -hmm. And so I've had folks from the, from our district go into our district office and say, Hey, you know, just wanted to make the connection and meet you guys. And mm -hmm. then the next time I was in town, I met with that person. And so it doesn't have to be super complicated. No. It, it really can be done so many different ways. And the impact is so real. It yeah. really, really is. Right. I mean, I was in DC last week and I literally was like, I don't even know what lobbying is, but here I go. And it was just, <laughs> it's just talking to you guys. It's just talking to your team about what's important to us and what we're frightened about. And like we started this, like we are, it's just a scary, scary world when it comes to the online uh, social media platforms and our kids using them. So you don't even have to know anything. Just go in and say, hey, what's going on with this? Like, this is something I'm concerned about. And we elect you guys to represent us in those concerns, right? So absolutely. Okay. Congresswoman Kamek, thank you so much for all your time. You're wonderful. You're inspiring. Um, thank you for being a voice for us and our children. We appreciate all your effort. So um, thank you again for your time. Oh, thank you so much. Have a good one and go Gators, of course. Yeah. <laughs>